And so Denis Villeneuve, the director, he said that he made this change as a way to ensure that moviegoers would not misinterpret the movie the way early book readers had misinterpreted the book. He didn't want to risk that. Hello and thank you for joining me here today at Why the Book Wins, where I compare books with their movie adaptations. My name is Laura and today I am talking about Dune Part 2, directed by Denis Villeneuve, released in 2024. And this is an adaptation of the second half of the book Dune by Frank Herbert, which was published in 1965. And I do have a book versus movie where I compare the first half of the book Dune to the 2021 Dune movie. So if you have not yet watched that video, you definitely should. I will link to it above as well as down in the the description. Ideally, you should watch that video before you watch this one because there are certain details in that video that I will not be reiterating here because in today's video I'm just going to dive right into part two. So I definitely recommend you watch that one first. And I will also not have a spoiler free section for this video. Again, we're just going to get right into the plot. So Dune, the first movie, we left off with the Harkonnens taking over Arrakis, killing off House of Atreides, and Paul and Jessica have met up with the Fremen. And after Paul killed Jameis in a duel, the Fremen have a respect for Paul and Jessica and it, they are being welcomed in, but the Fremen are a very closed off group. So it is hard to earn their trust, but they are definitely getting there. And there are also some Fremen who believe that Paul is their messiah, who they call the Lisan al Gaib. And Paul is very reluctant and he does not want to be this person because he has seen in visions that if he does, it will lead to like the jihad, which is a holy war, and it will lead to just the deaths of so many people. And he just does not want to take on that role. And I'm going to begin with Jessica now because in both book and movie, Stilgar, who is the leader of this Fremen group, he tells her in both book and movie, he wants her to be the Reverend Mother because their current Reverend Mother is very old. And in the movie, he doesn't really give her much choice. He's basically like, you can either become our Reverend Mother or you die. And so of course, she's gonna choose to become the Reverend Mother. In the book, I think she had more choice, but she definitely feels compelled to agree to do this. As as a way to ensure that her and Paul will be fully accepted by the Fremen. And in both book and movie, to become a reverend mother, it's different between different cultures. But the Fremen, you drink of the water of life. And the water of life is a liquid that comes from a dead sandworm. And it is poisonous to like most people. Men who drink it will die. And even women who drink it to become the reverend mother, some of them don't even survive it. And so it is a huge deal for Jessica to take this on. And when you become a reverend mother, you get all of the memories from all of the past Reverend Mothers. And so you're taking on the conscious of multiple people and like centuries of history, essentially. And so Jessica drinks the water of life and she survives it. So she does become the Reverend Mother. However, remember, Jessica is pregnant and the former Reverend Mother and her group, they did not know Jessica was pregnant. So when they realize she is, they're like, what have we done? Because now Jessica's unborn baby also has taken on the conscience of all of these reverend mothers and like centuries worth of history. And she also takes on all of Jessica's memories. And so this baby awakes into consciousness while it is still in the womb. And so throughout the movie, Jessica is pregnant with this fully conscious baby. And so we see her talking to this fetus in the movie. Whereas in the book, we do not see Jessica's pregnancy because after she becomes the Reverend Mother, we then do a time jump and fast forward two years. And so by that time, her child is a girl named Aaliyah and she is like two years old, but she acts like an adult. Not only does she act and talk like an adult, she is wiser than any other adult. And so people are very uncomfortable around her. Like the Fremen, some of them realize like why Aaliyah is like that. And it's because, you know, the water of life when she was still in Jessica's belly. But still, Fremen people are just very uncomfortable around Aaliyah and they find her very unsettling. And this right here is one of the big changes in book to movie for starters. Jessica is pregnant at the start of the movie and she is still pregnant by the end. So everything happens within a nine month span, less than nine months. Whereas in the book, this story spans years, which was more believable, right? Because so much happens. And so in the movie, it's like, wow, that happened in less than a year? Like that was fast. But also the fact that we don't actually see Aaliyah as like a living person. We just see her inside Jessica's belly in the movie. And it was cool the way Jessica would communicate with her. So that was a nice touch. But I just really missed seeing Aaliyah as a character because she was just so unique and interesting and so fascinating. And 
I just loved her in this book. And so yeah, I was very disappointed that we didn't see that. And I don't know why they made this change. I have a couple of theories. Let me know your ideas down below as to why they did not include like a real, you know, Aaliyah outside of the womb. <laughs> but I think for one, you would need a really good child actor, right? To play this very young child who acts like an adult, you know? That's a lot to ask of a child actor. If we could go back in time and get a five-year-old Dakota Fanning in the role, I think she would have nailed this because she was incredible, right? When she was a kid, she still is. But I do realize that child actors like Dakota Fanning and Haley Joel Osment, they don't grow on trees. And so it is hard to find someone who could really take that on. And, but also maybe it was a matter of money and just cutting characters is a way to save money, right? And so maybe they're like, we'll just cut Aaliyah entirely and that'll save on Cost. But ultimately, I the reason I think is probably the most likely is that Aaliyah, she works in the book, but maybe they feared that if they had this character in the movie, you know, this two-year-old who acts like an adult, maybe they thought it would just seem too sad silly is my thinking. And this is a movie that takes itself very seriously, right? And so rather than lean into some of the weird bizarreness of the book, like having Aaliyah, instead they chose to cut her out entirely. So I kind of think that is the reason why they did not include her. We do see, in a Paul has a vision and we do see like a grown-up Aaliyah played by Anya Taylor-Joy. But yeah, that's just one very brief scene. Obviously, if there is a third Dune movie, she will be a bigger role. But yeah, I was just really bummed that we did not see child Aaliyah because her parts in the book were just so good and I loved it and I was so excited to see her in the movie and then we don't even see her so yeah anyway let me know your thoughts down below let me know how you feel about not having Aaliyah in the movie but back to Jessica so in both book and movie we know that the Bene Gesserit who that is the group of women that Jessica is part of they had been spreading this prophecy of the Lisan al Gaib. they made it up and started telling the Fremen on Arrakis this and so it has been a prophecy that has been spread, I don't know when it began, but it's been a long time that they've been believing in this thanks to the Bene Gesserit who spread this. And in the movie, when Jessica becomes the Reverend Mother, she really leans into this and she encourages people to believe that Paul is the Lisan al Gaib. And we clearly see that she wants to manipulate and control people by using this religion against them and using Paul as their Lisan al Gaib. Even though Paul himself, he doesn't want her doing this and he gets upset at her, being like, stop telling people this, stop like encouraging the belief in this, like, I do not want you doing this. And then also in the movie, like, going south is a big deal because Jessica, she wants Paul to go to the South where a lot of the Fremen are considered these like religious fundamentalists where they are diehard believers in the prophecy. And so he does not want to go South because they are going to believe he is the Lisan al Gaib, and he just doesn't want to deal with that and he wants to avoid it. But Jessica wants him to go down there and drink of the water of life because a man, like I said, no man can survive drinking that. But if he does, that will cement him as the Lisan al Gaib, which is what Jessica wants. And this is very different from the book because in the book, Jessica is not encouraging the Fremen to believe Paul as their savior. And in fact, we get a conversation where Jessica chides Paul for kind of uh, not necessarily encouraging them to believe he is the Lisan al Gaib, but maybe going along with it more than she would like. And a conversation between the two of them reads, the Fremen have a simple practical religion, he said. Nothing about religion is simple, she warned. But Paul, seeing the clouded future that still hung over them, found himself swayed by anger. He could only say, religion unifies our forces. It's our mystique. You deliberately cultivate this air, this bravara, she charged. You never cease indoctrinating. Thus you yourself taught me, he said. And so yeah, in the book, it almost seems like Jessica kind of feels like she's created a monster, right? Because as he was growing up, she taught him these like Bene Gesserit ways. He was also trained to be a mentat when he was a kid in the book. And she also had hopes that he would be the Kwisak Cataract, right? And it was also her group who began indoctrinating the Fremen with this prophecy to begin with. And yet as things progress, she is kind of wishing Paul would put a stop to things. And then near the end of the book, when Paul has just become more cold hearted, a conversation between the two of them reads, Jessica glared at her son, shocked at the profound change in him. And she said, the men tell strange stories of you, Paul. They say you've all the powers of the legend. Nothing can be hidden from you and that, that you see where others cannot see. A Bene Gesserit should ask about legends, he asked. 
I've had a hand in whatever you are, she admitted, but you mustn't expect me to. How would you like to live billions upon billions of lives? Paul asked. There is a fabric of legends for you. Think of all those experiences, the wisdom they'd bring. But wisdom tempers love, doesn't it? And it puts a new shape on hate. How can you tell what's ruthless unless you've plumbed the depths of both cruelty and kindness? You should fear me, mother. I am the Kwisak Cataract. And then also in the book, going south wasn't a big thing the way they made it in the movie. Like it was this huge moment when he eventually does go to the south. But in the book, he doesn't go to the south for a while simply because he isn't needed there. And in the book, the people in the south aren't these like religious fundamentalists. It seems like in the south is just where a lot of the women and children are and it's where they make a lot of the materials and a lot of the spice products they have. It's all done in the south. And when we do that two-year time jump, we know that Paul is like somewhere for further north North, but all the women, Jessica, Chani, Aaliyah, as well as Paul and Chani's son are in the South. Because like I said, that's just where they stay a lot of the time. And so again, it wasn't this big deal like it was in the movie. Um, but yeah, like I just mentioned, in the book, Paul and Chani have a son of their own, which was not in the movie either. But in both book and movie, Paul eventually does go South and that is where he drinks the water of life. And like I said, in the movie, this is what Jessica wanted and what she had been trying to make happen. And so when she sees Paul, like everybody knows that he drank the water of life. And so they have Chani come because part of the prophecy is that Chani, like due to what her name means, her Fremen name, they know that part of the prophecy is that one of her tears will revive Paul. And so they call Chani to revive him and fulfill the prophecy. But Chani, she does not want this prophecy being fulfilled. She does not want Paul being worshipped. And so she does not want to revive him. However, Jessica uses the voice and forces her to do it. And so she combines her tear with a drop of the water of life, puts it on his lips, and then he is awakened. Whereas in the book, Jessica, again, she was not encouraging Paul to be the Laysan al Gaib. She was not wanting him to drink the water of life. And she just comes across him and he appears dead. But she checks his vitals and, you know, using her reverend mother ways, she knows that he is still alive, but that his vitals are so low that he appears dead. And he stays this way for two weeks before she gets the impression that she should call Chani and have her come down. And once Chani is there, she she is the one that is like, I bet he drank the water of life. I think that's what it is. And she knows that to revive him, she just takes a drop of the water of life, puts it on his lips, and then he is awakened. And after he drinks the water of life in both book and movie, like he already was having visions due to the spice and everything. But after he drinks the water of life, again, like it happens with the Reverend Mother, he then just gets, you know, centuries of histories and pasts. But he also sees the futures and he sees all of these potential futures. And he also sees people's inner thoughts and so it just gives him this whole new level of power and so the fact that he survived this cements him as the Lisan al Gaib as well as the Kwisak Cataract amongst the Bene Gesserit and in the movie we get a huge reveal after he drinks the water of life because again he can just see everything the past the present the future and it is after he drinks of this that he finds out that Jessica is the daughter of the Baron Harkonnen and the Atreides have been enemies with the Harkonnens for centuries and so realizing that he is the grandson of the Baron is a huge moment. And in the book, we found this out earlier. <laughs> this is like old news for book readers, but for the movie, this was a huge reveal. And speaking of the Harkonnens, I want to pivot now and talk about Fade Rotha. So Fade Rotha is the nephew of the Baron, and he will be the future Baron once Baron Vladimir Harkonnen dies. And in both book and movie, we see that he is someone who is a very skilled fighter, but he also is just really demented, and he takes pleasure in torturing people and all the using different poisons and just finding different ways to inflict pain on people. And he takes part in these gladiator fights that they put on to entertain the Harkonnens, but he always ensures he wins. And so he'll like, you know, use these like poison swords, but also they drug the prisoners he fights. So it's not a fair fight at all. And in both book and movie, we see him in one of these gladiator fights, but we see that one of the prisoners has not been poisoned. And in the movie, the Baron had the prisoner not be poisoned as a way to test Phaedroth and how he handles the situation and ultimately he wins and he kills the prisoner regardless. Whereas in the book, the Baron was surprised that the prisoner wasn't poisoned and it was actually Fade Rotha and also Thufir Howitt, who is now a Mentat for the Harkonnens in the book, they came up with the idea to have the prisoner not be poisoned. But they still like made sure Fade would win. But yeah, in the book, it, they like wanted the slave master punished and so they didn't poison the prisoner. That way the Baron would blame the slave master and he would be killed killed. I don't know why they wanted that. <laughs> if you read the book, if you have a clearer understanding as to Fade's intentions and why 
or how it suggested this, let me know in the comments because I wasn't quite sure in the book what the point of Fade not wanting the prisoner drugged meant. But in both book and movie, we see that after this gladiator fight, he is then seduced by Lady Fenring, who is a Bene Gesserit, and she wants to seduce him. That way she can have his baby and secure the bloodline because the Bene Gesserit are obsessed with bloodlines. And in the movie, before they have sex though, she puts him through the Gom Jabbar test, which was not in the book. And in the movie, Fade definitely seems more ruthless and savage and more demented and twisted. <laughs> he kills his own people over the littlest things. He has like this group of cannibal women with him. And we also get to see him take charge over Arrakis. And again, we see how ruthless he is. And there's this like great scene where he has Raban kiss his boot because Raban has failed, you know? Uh, whereas, yeah, Fade in the book, he was definitely demented in his own way as all the Harkonnens are, but he didn't seem to like be quite as sadistic as movie Fade. For example, there is a part in the book where Fade tries to kill the Baron and the Baron like kind of respects Fade for this, but ultimately, you know, he still needs to punish Fade for trying to kill him. And so to punish him, he has, he tells Fade that he needs to kill all of the women that are part of their harem. And Fade in the book is kind of like, what? Like he's, I don't know if bothered is the right word, but he is kind of taken aback at being forced to kill all of these women who have done nothing wrong, you know? Whereas in the movie if he was told to kill random people for no reason movie fade I don't think he would have an issue with that he would just be like okay fine cool like I I'm good with that and so yeah that was kind of one difference between fade and book and movie and then yeah in the book we do not see fade take charge over Arrakis it is like it's brought up so much the fact that the Baron wants him to take over Raban's spot and he also wants him to become emperor and he is kind of like Paul's parallel in a way in, in certain aspects but then ultimately we never even see it happen. And Frank Herbert does do this with a number of things where he kind of subverts your expectations, right? Like parts of this story seem like it's going in the typical direction you would expect, but then something happens and it totally either is anticlimactic, like, okay, we never even saw fate take control, uh, or it just is kind of flipped on its head and things happen in unexpected ways. But also another thing that was kind of a subversion of expectations is the fact that Gurney Halleck is obsessed with getting revenge on the Harkonnens, specifically Raban. Uh, Gurney had been in the slave pits along with his family and his sister and Raban, I think specifically is who killed his sister. And he also was tortured in these slave pits. So he is obsessed with getting revenge on Raban. And we hear about it so much in the book. And then Raban is killed off page. We don't even see it. And Gurney isn't even the one who does it. Like Stilgar is the one who comes to report that Raban is dead. And so you're just like, what? <laughs> like we've been hearing so much about Gurney and his revenge and then he never even gets it, which again, I think is kind of the point. But to talk about Raban, so yeah, he has been set up to fail on Arrakis. And in the book, partway through the Baron, he cuts off all supplies from uh, Raban and he does not give him any more people. And Raban is losing so many soldiers to the Fremen who keep attacking and he's not fulfilling his spice quotas. And so he is just so tense and he's just not doing well. <laughs> and people also hate him because he's like such a tense leader who is trying to get results, but he's not getting results. And so he's very disliked while also just failing at his job. And in the movie, we do not see the Baron cut off supplies or anything like that. But instead, as Raban is failing, in the movie, we do see the Baron have Fade step in and he puts Fade in charge. And then yeah, in both book and movie, Raban ends up being killed. Like I said, in the book, it seems like he's killed by Stilgar. Whereas in the movie, which it's funny, because the movie does the opposite of Frank Herbert, where we do see Fade get to be in charge of Arrakis. And we also do get to see Gurney get his revenge. In the movie, Maybe he wants revenge on Raban just for, you know, killing the Atreides. And so yeah, Gurney, we see him kill Raban in the movie. And in both book and movie, Fade and Paul end up having a fight at the very end. And Fade ultimately ends up being killed by Paul in both book and movie. The reason for the duel is different from both, but ultimately the point is he and Paul fight. It's a close call, but Fade dies. And then I want to move on to Paul and Chani, which I know I'm not talking about this chronologically. I'm kind of getting into the character specifically rather than talking about it linearly. So I apologize if that's confusing. It made sense 
to me as I wrote up my outline. But anyway, to talk about Paul and Chani. So in both book and movie, they end up falling in love. And in the book, it's interesting because we see part of the reason they fall in love so quickly is because they both see the future and they see that they will fall in love. And so it's that weird paradox where they fall in love because they know they're going to fall in love if that makes sense. Uh, which yeah, Chani, she can see the future too because Melange, the spice, it gives everybody powers. Paul, of course, we see it gives him like even more visions than normal, but when you have a high spice intake, it does give you certain powers. And also after Jessica becomes the Reverend Mother, so she drinks the water of life. This is specific to the book. She drinks the water of life, which is poison, but she survives it. But after she drinks it, she like does something to it. She changes it so that it becomes kind of like spice liquor, I guess. And then all of the Fremen get drunk and high on the spice. And this is something they'll often do. And the spice also gives them this like group conscious. And when they're high on the spice liquor, they also have orgies and it's part of how <laughs> they bond amongst the Fremen. But while they are on this spice liquor, Paul and Chani go off on their own and we read, he forced himself to speak distinctly. What do you see? She looked down at her hands. I see a child in my arms. It's our child, yours and mine. She put a hand to her mouth. How can I know every feature of you? They've a little of the talent, his mind told him, but they suppress it because it terrifies. So yeah, the Fremen have the ability to get powers from the spice, but they suppress it. But also on top of that, later on we talk about how, later on in the book he talks about how when you have a high spice tolerance, your visions become less so. We read, his body had slowly acquired a certain spice tolerance that made prescient visions fewer and fewer, dimmer and dimmer. And so this is said of Paul specifically, and in the book this is why Paul decides to drink the water of life because the spice isn't giving him the powerful visions it used to because he has a high tolerance now. And I'm assuming that goes for the Fremen as well. So maybe that's another thing is that because their tolerance is so high, that is also why they have kind of lost the ability to get as much power from it. And this is not something that is delved into the movie at all. And honestly, spice doesn't even come into play very much in the second movie. We hear about it more in the first and why it's so important and what it can do and we see how it affects Paul. But in this movie, we don't really see the spice affecting Paul in the same way. Whereas in the book, like I said, he's having these intense visions for a while in the book without having to drink the water of life. And then yeah, the way the Fremen use the spice as well. And the Fremen also like everything they make comes from spice, like the paper they use and like the clothing they wear and the rugs and the food and the coffee and like everything is spice. And again, because they have such a high spice diet, they also have this like group conscience where there's a part where Jessica thinks how she wants some coffee and then suddenly without saying anything someone happens to bring her some coffee and it's part of the group conscience going on. So yeah I kind of wish the movie would have delved a bit more into that and also just why the spice is such a big deal. I mean we talk about it in the first movie so I guess that's why he didn't feel the need to talk about it again but yeah in the movie we do not get you know this scene where she sees a future with him instead they just fall in love more naturally and I did think the scenes between the two of them were really sweet and cute early on as we see them falling in love. And then yeah, I mentioned earlier that they end up having a son in the book. So it's in that time jump see that they have a son who is like one years old. So he's like a baby still. However, he ends up dying. In both book and movie, the home of the Fremen ends up being attacked. And in the movie, it is Fade who his group go in and attack the, it's called a Sietch. So it's Fade's doing in the movie. But in the book, it was when the emperor arrives, like kind of his group is who goes in and attacks. And yeah, their son, whose name is Leto, ends up dying. And the movie does not have this son at all. The movie, like I said, it doesn't even span enough time for them to have a son. So that right there wouldn't allow it. But also the son was just such a nothing character. We don't get any scenes with him. He is just referenced. And so I was totally fine with the movie not having him. But a scene I really want to talk about from the movie and now seems like a fine time is when Paul rides the sandworm. So in the book, Chani had been in the south, but then she comes up north where Paul is because he is getting ready to ride the sandworm and this is a huge rite of passage for any Fremen and in both book and movie he ends up unintentionally bringing in like the biggest sandworm and so everybody's just like whoa like this is insane how can he do this for the first time with no help but of course he does succeed and he is able to ride the sandworm
sandworm. And in the book, Stilgar ends up like jumping on with him at some point too. And we get a, get a conversation between the two of them. And the book also goes into more of the logistics of riding a sandworm and how to get off the sandworm and just all of that stuff. But this scene in the movie, when he is riding the sandworm, it was just magnificent. I loved it so much. It was one of my favorite scenes. It was so tense and thrilling and magical and powerful and just it, it was just incredible and I, like I said it was probably my favorite scene in the movie or at least one of my top favorite scenes it yeah it was just so well done and I absolutely loved it but side note they must go through so many thumpers right because they use a thumper to call a sandworm but it's not like they go and retrieve it the sandworm just ends up eating the thumper I guess so yeah are they like a one-time use thing like they look so high tech but it's like why make something so high tech that can only be used once we never see any of them retrieve a thumper. But anyway, uh, let me know your thoughts on the thumpers down below in the comments. Are they just a one-time use? But in the book and movie, Paul gets two Fremen names. So his private Fremen name is Usul, and then his fighter Fremen name is Moadib. And Moadib means desert mouse. And so as he leads the Fremen on these attacks on the Harkonnens, he is referred to as Moadib. And so even though other people outside of the Fremen hear about this Moadib who is leading the Fremen in these attacks, they think it's just some random Fremen because again, everybody thinks that Paul and Jessica were both killed. And also the Harkonnens, they severely underestimate the Fremen. So they severely underestimate the number. And then they also underestimate just the skills of the Fremen, right? And they kind of dismiss them as they're just like, oh, like they're the crazy desert people. And this underestimating is also what causes Raban to struggle so much, right? Because he's not realizing the extent of the Fremen's skills and their numbers. And then on top of that, you have Paul now leading them as Moadib, and so they are just a force to be reckoned with. And also in book and movie, they think the South is uninhabitable. Whereas we know the South, there's a lot of Fremen down there, but they just think no one can survive the South, so they don't even bother going down there to check. And throughout book and movie, while Paul as Moadib is leading the Fremen on attacking the Harkonnens and trying to reclaim Arrakis as their own, he still is resisting being the lease on Al-Gaib. Like I said, in the book, even before he drinks the water of life, he does start embracing it a bit more. Whereas in the movie, it is once he drinks the water of life, that is when he really turns a corner. And that is what really cements him as the Lisan Al-Gaib, as well as the Kwisak Cataract. And we get a scene in both book and movie where in the movie, this is after he has drank the water of life, where he just has full power. Whereas in the book, it actually happens before he even drinks the water of life. But in both, Stilgar wants Paul to kill him because he's like, you're more powerful than me, which means you should be the new leader. And according to Fremen tradition, you need to kill the former leader to show that you're better than me. And so that's just the way we do it. And in both book and movie, Paul is like, why would I do that? That's so stupid. Stilgar is such an asset and he is so strong and incredible. To kill him would be so ridiculous. Like it'd be like cutting off my right arm. And then he also, because there's a group of Fremen here and they want him to kill Stilgar because they're like, that's the way we do things. That's the way. But Paul, he's like, like, well, I'm here to change the way. We're not doing it like that anymore. And he also says in both book and movie, he's like, I could take down every one of you Fremen. And so like, it's just a silly tradition at this point because I could be all of you. So what's the point, you know? And then also in the movie, like I said, at this point, he has drank the water of life. And so as he is surrounded by these Fremen, he points out one of them in the crowd and he is able to tell this man like what's going on in his head right now and what he's thinking and what his past is. And again, this is a powerful moment and just all of this makes the Fremen believe that he is definitely the Lisan al-Gaib and at this point is basically when Paul accepts it as well. And Paul does do a lot of yelling in the movie especially in this scene right here but I thought Timothy Chalamet was amazing as Paul. I thought he was great in the first movie as well when Paul is more innocent and naive but then seeing him in this movie where he takes on this leadership role and he matures and his character you know he just changes so much in this movie but yeah I thought Timothy Chalamet was great. I thought the actor by everybody it was just superb. And in the book, Paul at one point, he makes the sad observation that he keeps losing friends and gaining worshipers. And we read, in that instant, Paul saw how Stilgar had been transformed from the Fremen Naib, which is a Fremen leader, basically, transformed from a Fremen Naib to a creature of the Lisan Al-Gaib, a receptacle for awe and obedience. It was a lessening of the man and Paul felt the ghost wind of the Jihad in it. I have seen a friend become a worshiper, he thought. 
And he does have a similar line in the movie when he's talking to Gurney and he's explaining why he does not want to be their leader. And he says like, I've already lost friends and gained worshipers and I don't want that to continue. But yeah, I thought that line in the book, like it's just so well worded and how he even says like, it's a lessening of the man. And he feels like the worshipers now are just a creature and a receptacle for awe and obedience of him. And speaking of Gurney, so in both book and movie, Gurney had been hanging out with smugglers, but then he coincidentally runs into Paul and so he ends up teaming up with Paul and the Fremen. And in the movie, he tells Paul about the Atreides atomic weapons, which are hidden on Arrakis. And because of Paul's genetics, he's the only one who has access to them. So Gurney is like, you should use the atomics and then you can put an end to this war with the Harkonnens. Like using atomics, that'll give you the edge that you need. And they do end up using the atomics to attack, but they also use the atomics, like they have them placed, like when he sees the emperor, he tells him that we have atomics aimed in like spice production areas. And if we fire them, that is the end of spice. Melange will no longer exist. And Melange is very important by threatening to destroy it is how they gain leverage to get what they want. And as Paul says in the book, he who can destroy a thing has the real control over it. Whereas in the book, this is not the case. <laughs> Gurney shows up and there are no Atreides atomics. And so therefore there isn't any atomics for Gurney to be suggesting Paul use. And in the book, they do create an atomic weapon, but it is Paul's creation where he has the idea to combine the water of life with a pre-spice mass, which is something that the worms create when they're making the spice. And this pre-spice mass is what ended up killing kinds in the book, which I mentioned in the previous episode. But yeah, so when you combine these two things, it creates like an explosion essentially. And in the book we read that when they do this, it will cause the spreading of death among the little makers, killing a vector of the life cycle that includes the spice and the makers. Arrakis will become a true desolation without spice or maker. And so he wants to do this again to threaten the Imperium as a way to be like, hey, I'll destroy all of the spice if you don't give me what I want. But they also do use it to cause an explosion which will break down the shield wall that is protecting the Emperor and all of his people in the Harkonnens. But yeah, in the book, again, Gurney is not on board with this and he doesn't want them using any kind of atomic explosions or anything. And when he is questioning Paul on this, we read, Paul barked, it's fear, not the injunction that keeps the houses from hurling atomics against each other. The language of the Great Convention is clear enough. Use of atomics against humans shall be cause for planetary obliteration. We're going to blast the shield wall, not humans. It's too fine a point, Gurney said. The hair splitters up there will welcome any point, Paul said. Let's talk no more about it. So again, they definitely made some big changes with Gurney and Lady Jessica, you know, Jessica, the Reverend Mother, where yeah, Gurney is like pushing him to use the atomics and Jessica is encouraging people to believe him as the Lisan al-Gayib, whereas this was like the opposite in the book with both of them. But yeah, and to talk about the ending, so in book and movie, like the emperor, I forget his name, like Padashah Shaddam or something, he and all of his entourage and his daughter, Princess Irulan, the Reverend Mother, the Imperium, Imperial Reverend Mother, as well as like the Baron Harkonnen and Fade Ratha, they all show up to Arrakis. And in the book, you know, they attack one of the Fremen homes. And they end up taking Aaliyah hostage, but Aaliyah, she like chooses, <laughs> like she allows herself to be taken hostage. And when she is there with the Emperor and the Baron, she ends up killing the Baron. And then from here, Paul later meets up with the Emperor. And this is when he kills Fade Ratha. And then as a political move, he tells the Emperor that he will marry Princess Irulan and he will then become the new emperor and he banishes the current emperor to Seleucus Secundus, the prison planet. And Chani, like she is there as well. And she, this is before Paul says he's going to marry Irulan, but Chani can kind of see where things are going. And so she tells Paul, like, you have no obligation to me. <laughs> like, don't worry about it. Do whatever you got to do. But Paul tells her like, no, you're the most important person. I love you. You will always be by my side. And even after he says he is going to marry the princess Irulan, he expresses to Chani how like, she is only wife in name. Like she's not going to get any attention from me, like no physical attention or otherwise. Don't worry about it. Like you are the one I love. And Chani, Chani like she still seems upset by this, but then Lady Jessica, she had been Duke Leto's concubine. She had never been the wife. And then she says to Chani, yet Irulan will live as less than a concubine, never to know a moment of tenderness from the man to whom she's bound. While we, Chani, we who carry the name of concubine, 
history will call us wives. This is the last line of the book. <laughs> so it definitely seems like there is this quote holds a lot of weight, right? Because the book ends on this. And I'm trying to figure out like what the message is of this final sentence. And is it showing how history changes the facts potentially? Or is it showing just like the coldness of politics and leadership? Like I, I'm honestly not entirely sure why the book ends on this line in particular and why it makes such a big deal about Chani being a concubine and yet in the eyes of the world she's a concubine but really she is more of a wife to Paul than Irulan will be. Yeah like let me know your thoughts in the comments. <laughs> I still haven't quite formulated what I think that is implying in the greater sense of things and as far as Paul becoming the emperor and yeah I just thought it was a really interesting line to end on and I would love to know how you interpret it and what you think it means. But to talk about the movie ending so in the movie again Aaliyah still exists inside Jessica's belly and so it is Paul. So the emperor like strikes the baron and so he's fallen down from like the suspenser things that like hold him up and so Paul shows up and he finishes off the job and he kills the baron and then you know he kills Fade Rotha like I said and then Chani, so she has been resisting Paul taking on this role the whole time. She does not like him using the atomics. She does not like him being the least on all Gaib and taking on this role and being worshipped. And so she's just not liking the person he is becoming. And in this scene, he tells her like, I will love you until my last breath. But then right after that, he turns to the emperor and he's like, I will marry Irulan. That way I can be the new emperor. And so Chani is just like heartbroken by this and she leaves. And the other great houses they are all like in the atmosphere as well and when they send the message that Paul is the new emperor like they're not on board with that they do not accept him as emperor and so this is what causes the jihad the holy war and so all of the other Fremen they are happy to go fight in battle to you know reclaim Arrakis but also to fight for Paul to be the emperor but yeah Chani she doesn't she calls a sandworm and she goes off to do her own thing and I did want to clarify at the end of the book it is not like blatantly said that there is a holy war that is starting the jihad you know in the movie that's like the last line of the film is she's like the holy war begins but the book it's heavily implied but it isn't quite as blatant as the movie is so that was another change and yeah, with Paul, you know, going down a bad path in the book, there's a part in this like showdown between he and the emperor and everybody. There's a part where Thufir Howitt and then Lady Jessica at two different points, they say how Paul is more like his grandfather, the Baron Harkonnen, than he is like his own father. And as we saw in the first half of the book, Leto was a very strong leader and he was respected and loved by his people. But part of that respect and love came because he respected and loved them you know? And so Paul, instead of following in the footsteps of his father and the way he led, instead he's leading in a more cold and ruthless way. And so multiple people are like, you're a lot like the Baron right now, your grandfather. And throughout the course of the story, he does become, he does become colder. And at one point after a battle, there has been a lot of damage done and a lot of lives lost. And we read, nothing money won't repair, I presume, Paul said. Except for the lives, my lord, Gurney said, and there was a tone of reproach in his voice as though to say, when did an Atreides worry first about things when people were at stake? And in the movie, we don't get people saying that he's reminding them of the Baron, but we do get a part where the Emperor talks to Paul about Duke Leto, and he says that Duke Leto was a bad leader because he led by the heart, and that made him weak. And so that's kind of showing how, again, Paul, he's not leading by the heart at this point, right? And he is cold and logistical, I guess you could say. But yeah, the change to Chani is very different, right? In the book, she was also, you know, grieving the loss of her son in the book, and so she is dealing with a lot, but she's very compliant, right? And she goes along with Paul choosing to marry Irulan and have her be the concubine. Whereas in the movie, throughout the story, as Paul is progressing, Chani is more and more resistant to him and she does not like the path he is going down. And she sees the way this religion is being used to manipulate people. Like, like other people see it, like Gurney see that this is being used to control people, but they're on board with it. So Chani is one of the few who sees the truth and she stands up against it throughout the movie. And of the books, Frank Herbert, the author said, the bottom line of the Dune trilogy is beware of heroes. 
goes. Much better to rely on your own judgment and make your own mistakes. And so the intention was to have like this cautionary tale of the Messiah trope gone wrong, essentially. And when people become too fanatical, right? And when too much power is given to certain people and we rest everything on this person. And so that was his intent with the book Dune. However, early readers did not see that and they were cheering Paul on and they thought he was the hero of the story. And so Frank Herbert was like, they are not getting the message. <laughs> that was not my intent. And so with Dune Messiah, he made sure to make it very clear what he is going for with this story and to make sure people realize what the message is, you know? And so Denny Villeneuve, the director, he said that he made this change with Chani as a way to ensure that moviegoers would not misinterpret the movie the way early book readers had misinterpreted the book. He didn't want to risk that. And so he had Chani be like the moral compass of the movie. And I think that's also why he made Jessica, again, more cunning and manipulative, as well as Gurney, right? Because again, he sees what's going on, but he's on board with it. And so I think the director made those changes with Chani and Jessica so that we would know without a doubt what the message of this movie is. And to talk about the Messiah trope, because again, I just love the way Frank Herbert wrote this story. And that as well is one of those aspects that doesn't go the way you think. Like you think Paul is going to end the hero, but instead you see him end a villain in a sense, which he, he has more nuance than that. So I don't want to make it seem like he's a cartoonish villain because Paul, yeah, he's very layered and nuanced and he is just a very fleshed out character. But yeah, he ends up being very cold hearted, caring less about human lives. And yeah, he causes this jihad to happen in Dune Messiah. We find out that billions of people died from this war that lasted over a decade. And so again, Frank Herbert is subverting our expectations, right, about what we had going into the book. And we see that things are not playing out the way we thought they would. But I did want to talk about how like there's parallels to Dune, the book, with the story of Jesus Christ in the Bible because this is like a retelling of that story in a lot of ways, which is common to do like in general, retellings are very popular, but a lot of stories are retellings of the Christ story in the Bible. One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, for example, that book is a retelling of like the Jesus story. And so I just think that's really interesting. Like if I were to ever write a book, I think my first book would be some sort of retelling. Like I would find some popular fairy tale or something and retell it and put my own spin on it. Because one, it's a good place place to start because you kind of have an outline to some extent. But also, I just think it's so fun to find how people put their own spin on different stories. But anyway, just because I find it interesting, I wanted to share some parallels between Dune and the biblical story of Christ. So for starters, we have Leah Kynes who paved the way before Paul shows up. And that is very similar to John the Baptist in the Bible, both of whom end up being killed. And then Paul is born of a holy mother, Jessica, who is a Bene Gesserit, who becomes the Reverend Mother. And of course, Mary, the mother mother of Jesus becomes a holy figure as well. And Christ rose from the dead. And we see that with Paul too. After he drinks the water of life, people say he's dead, but then he is revived and he comes back to life. And Paul also changes the customs of the Fremen, right? Like I said, the Fremen had these traditions and Paul is like, that's not the way anymore. I am showing you the new way. And Christ did that as well, where he showed up and he broke traditions. And he was like, no, like I'm the way now. This is how it is. Specifically, he stops them sacrificing animals, right? That stopped after Christ showed up and put an end to it. And then Christ also had disciples who he said, like when they spoke, it will be as he is speaking kind of a thing. And we get that with Stilgar, where Paul tells the Fremen, Stilgar leads this tribe. Let no man mistake that. He commands with my voice. What he tells you, it is as though I told you. And then of course, there have been so many wars and so much death in the name of Christianity right? And Christ himself wasn't leading those wars, but it was done in his name. And we get that with Paul, right? This jihad is fought in the name of Moadib, you know, in the name of the Lisan al-Gaib. And so, yeah, I just thought it was really interesting to see those parallels. Those, those are the ones that I personally noticed. If there's others you noticed, share down below in the comments. But also, I don't want to boil down Dune to being like a biblical retelling and that's all it is, because that would be selling it short, because this book and also just the Dune universe that is created throughout the rest of the books is so expansive and so detailed and just so inventive and just so incredible. So I do not want you thinking it is simply a retelling. <laughs> 
because it is just so much more than that, right? And also, it is just interesting how Paul, like, he is reluctant to be the Lisan al Gaib, and yet, unbeknownst to him, he keeps fulfilling different prophecies. But then it gets to the point where he just accepts this role and he takes on, you know, being their leader and their prophet and their savior. And so it's interesting because, on one hand, you know, it's a self fulfilling prophecy by the Fremen and the Bene Gesserit. But then at the same time, like, he does fulfill these prophecies unintentionally, though. Like, he does survive the water of life. He does have these different powers. He does have the knowledge of how to wear the still suit and just all of these little things. He does fulfill them without even meaning to. And so part of me is like, maybe the prophecy was real and maybe he really was the Lisan al Gaiv and he really was the Kwisak Cataract, right? But then again, the prophecy was made up by the Bene Gesserit. <laughs> so then it's like, was it all just a self-fulfilling prophecy where Paul was just pushed into this and it really was just coincidence? So interesting to think about, right? Like, was the prophecy real or is it all just a self-fulfilling prophecy that is pushed on him and the power, he just takes it all on, you know? And throughout the book and movie, he is resistant to this power. Again, he kind of gives into it sooner in the movie, bit by bit, or sorry, sooner in the book. But yeah, in the movie, he says how he's worried what will happen if he gains power and he's worried what he will lose in the process. And in the movie, he loses Chani, right? And she was the most important person to him. But then in both, he also just loses parts of who he is. Yeah, I just think it's so fascinating. But really, even though it is interesting to speculate on the prophecy, at the end of the day, it doesn't even matter whether or not Paul was truly fulfilling this real prophecy or not, because that isn't the point of the story, right? As said, Herbert wrote this to show that no one should have this much power and control, and people shouldn't put so much on a single person to the point that the people become these fanatical followers, and they lose who they are, and instead are just obsessed with this leader that they have put up on a pedestal, you know? Again, going back to that quote, how Stilgar and the other worshipers, they almost lose their own humanness in a way and become a receptacle for awe and obedience, as said. Yeah, let me know your thoughts down below in the comments. Oh, and also to talk about the Kwisak Cataract. So the Bene Gesserit wanted to cause the coming of the Kwisak Cataract, and they had intended to use this powerful person as a way to fulfill their desires, right? And they kind of, I guess they thought that they would be able to control the Kwisak Cataract. But of course, when the Imperial Reverend Mother is there with the Emperor, Paul puts her in her place and he's like, I will never do your bidding and you will never be able to control me. But just to share a couple other changes from book to movie, so I mentioned Thufir Howitt because he was thinking how Paul was more like the Baron, right? When he meets with them, when he's with the Emperor. And so yeah, in the book, Thufir Howitt is blackmailed by the Harkonnens to become their Mentat. And then when he meets up with Paul in this moment with everybody there, he ends up committing suicide. And Thufir Howitt is not in the second movie at all. And then also in the book, Howitt and Gurney, they thought Jessica was the one who betrayed the Atreides to the uh, Harkonnens. And so when Gurney meets up with Paul and Jessica, he tries to kill Jessica and they have to like calm him down and be like, no, no, like Yui, he was the traitor, like don't kill Jessica. And again, this was not in the movie. And also in the book, there's a character named Count Fenring, and he is also part of the Bene Gesserit. So he was like a Kwisak Cataract hopeful who didn't <laughs> pan out, and he ends up being close friends with the Emperor. And there's a part at the end after Paul kills Fade, the Emperor tells Count Fenring to kill Paul. And Count Fenring and Paul both know that Fenring could kill Paul, that he would be capable to do it. But Fenring says no, that he won't do it. He and Paul have this moment where they have this like mutual respect for each other because they're both products of the Bene Gesserit, right? And so they have this mutual respect, which causes Count Fenring to not kill Paul. And he is not in the movie. I did read that they filmed scenes with Fenring and Howitt in this movie, but they both ended up on the cutting room floor. And in the movie, there is a part when, I think it's when Paul is deciding whether or not to go south. There's a part where he like is trying to communicate with Jameis, the Fremen he killed, in order to receive guidance from him. And this was not in the book. And there are some other changes, but I feel like those are like some of the bigger ones that I noticed. And like the book, there's so much to the book, right? So to mention everything from the book that is not in the movie, that would be a lot. But again, I think I've touched on the bigger aspects. But comment down below if there's a big aspect that you think I should have mentioned that I didn't. And now it's time to talk about book versus movie. So with Dune part one, I said that the book wins over the first movie and I still stand by that. But when it comes to part two, <laughs> I think I'm gonna have to say the movie wins. And that is, 
partly due to the fact that these adaptations are just so fantastic. And so it would seem unfair to give it to the book in both episodes, right? Like I feel like it's got to be an even score between the two of them. But also I do think the movie, the second movie in particular, I think they did a good job at staying true to the message of the book and the themes. And I think the change to Chani, I know some people don't like that, but I understand his intent, right? As a way for the audience to make sure we know <laughs> what the message is. Uh, and also Jessica, I'm kind of sad that they made her like the villain <laughs> in the new movie in a sense. But regardless, that change did make her a very compelling character in the movie, right? And then they also tried trim down the plot a lot, right? Because there are so many <laughs> politics going on with like the guild and the Imperium and Chome and just there's so much going on there that we do not get into in the movie. And that was a good call because it would have been too much and too complicated for a movie. So he did a really good job at condensing the story and simplifying it while still staying true to the message and the overall story. I, again, I am sad we don't see Aaliyah and kind of to go along with that, I do wish maybe like the movie take themselves very seriously, you know? And so part of me wishes that he allowed it to be a bit more bizarre than it ended up being because the books are just bizarre. There's so much crazy stuff going on. And so Villeneuve ended up making it less weird and uh, a bit more grounded, I guess you could say. And while I do like the movies for what they are, you know, I still, I, I part of me wishes maybe he would have leaned into that weirdness a bit more, you know? Like the David Lynch film, they really <laughs> leaned into the bizarre and the weirdness. And I do enjoy that in that movie. What I don't enjoy in that movie was just how disturbing the Baron was. Like they went all out on making the Baron so gross to the point where like it made me sick to look at him in certain scenes. I it was just hard to watch. So that, as well as the ending of Dune, the 1984 Dune, the ending is horrible and it's sped up and it totally misses the message of the book. But I do like that they leaned into the weirdness. <laughs> and again, ultimately I love this movie and I love the final product. So even the complaints I have, I still feel confident saying that the movie wins over the book. Like it was just so visually spectacular, right? And there were so many just incredible scenes. The acting was fantastic. Riding the sandworm, the gladiator battle, Battle with Fade Rotha and just all the scenes with Fade Rotha were just so good. But yeah, I just I just thought the movie was incredible. This could be recency bias because I literally, you know, just saw it in theaters and it was such an amazing experience. So down the road, maybe I'll be like, what? Like, no, the book definitely wins all the way around. But as of right now, I'm going to say part one, the book wins. Part two, the movie wins. And that is where I will end it. And again, Dune is such an expansive universe, the story that Duke Frank Herbert created. And I will be getting into more of Dune the books in a future video. So I'm currently halfway through the third book, but I will have a video in the next couple weeks where I will be joined by my brother, who is a huge Dune fan. He has read all the books. And we're just gonna talk about the books and all of the details and get into what happens as well and how we feel about that. And I will also be asking him about how he feels about these these movies and get his opinion and see if he agrees with me or not. So yeah, so that'll be a really good video. And for all of you like diehard Dune fans, that is definitely a video you should watch because again, we will be getting into the bigger details of the Dune universe as we see things play out through the rest of the books. But also I am going to be watching the mini series from the early 2000s. So later in March, I will have another video coming out where I share my thoughts on that. So we are still not done with Dune videos here at Why the Book Wins. I have at least two more slotted for the future. So yeah, I hope you guys have been enjoying my Dune related videos and do not forget to like and subscribe if you have not already. And thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time. Bye.